It is my great honour to welcome here today Major General Chip Chapman. Uh, General Chapman served for 33 years and deployed on numerous operations, uh, including the Falklands and five tours in Northern Ireland, before retiring as a Major General in 2013. Today he will be talking about his experiences in the Falklands campaign, and in particular how as a young platoon commander he inspired and motivated his young leaders uh, to push forward and engage the enemy in a challenging battle. We're very grateful for General Chapman to come down here today, so please offer him a warm welcome. Uh, why is the Falklands of interest to you? You now talk about five domains of war where cyber and space have been added to land, sea and air. Don't be seduced by those profits of cyber warfare because you can't cyber your way out of conflict. And we went ashore in the Falklands, not with space power, but for the first time since Gallipoli in 1915, without even an air photo. It was a land, sea, air conflict where we campaigned in ways that the British Army did not in Afghanistan and Iraq. We were under air attack constantly. We saw British ships sunk. I personally saw four. And at the end of the day, it was a war where sheer bloody-mindedness to succeed or die trying in the process remained as relevant as it did with Leonardus at the pass at Thinopoli with a few hundred Spartans. It was often gutter fighting. The character of war may change, but its nature does not. In the Falklands, we were not bewildered for long in the fight with our enemies, nor did we fear them. Every Tom, NCO, and officer only feared that he might somehow disappoint those who preceded him or those around him. It never collectively happened. In the company, in World War II, cohesion in the, German, uh, in the American army was at squad level. In the British Army, it was at platoon level. In the German Army, it was at company level. In 1982, we were the Germans. There was an incredible cohesion at company level engendered for us by our very charismatic leader, Major John Crossland, who's in the audience and will be in the um, Q&A. The blokes would have actually followed him off a cliff. He was Churchillian in the sense that he gave credence to the notion that we can do anything, not I can do anything. That belief was important because a company is a two-op level for you as section commanders. Understand the intent, two-op, and follow it, ignoring the one-op intent if the situation demands it. Our standards, we knew that our job was to fight and fight well. Our values as leaders, don't be a dickhead. No one was managed up a hill. They were led there. And we knew our legacy. In order to have a legacy, you must know history. Without a history, you have no legacy. We fought in the footsteps of Six Platoon at Arnhem, of the famous Grunart twins who were both killed in action on the 17th of September, 1944. Late in the day, on the 28th of May, 1982, B Company were in a spot of bother. We were once again heavily shelled and open op on, and a fleet of enemy helicopters came in with reinforcements. The casualty figures came on the radio, and they suggested that we'd had seven officers killed. I thought, if we've had seven officers killed, how many of the blokes have been killed? We must be the only company left. I went up to John Crossland and I said, what do we do now? And he said, this is Arnhem, day three. But there was no suggestion of anyone jacking. It was, come on, you bastards, come and take us on. Those in 94's legacy to us was match that. We now say the same thing to you guys and girls who sit in front of us. 
match that. Our company 2IC, Captain John Young, was badly injured. Not one of the platoon commanders was experienced enough, really, to have replaced either him or the OC, should he and his black hat, for he never wore a helmet, have been killed. As an aside, in 1982, we didn't wear body armour, but we did in Northern Ireland. None of the three platoon commanders had completed the platoon commanders course. We all did it after the war. So in January 1983, of the seven parachute regiment officers who were on the platoon commanders course, six had actually been in the Falklands. So B Company 2 Para was an organization that had both vertical cohesion between leader and led and horizontal cohesion between the blokes. It was an awesome organization which had a shared commitment to achieving its goal uh, that required the collective efforts of everyone. I now sanctify you with vertical cohesion and horizontal cohesion. Go forth after this day and be great. The platoon. You would assume that platoon commanders are now competent. In war, character trumps competence, which is just as well because I wasn't very competent in 1982 because I wasn't really that well trained as an individual. But I was liked by the blokes, had been in six platoon for a year, and they vaguely respected me and my fitness. There was a strong leadership followership bond and war reveals the depths of personality, which has multiple layers involving character, manners, behavior, personality, and individuality. All these are different for each soldier, and combat modifies fundamental ideas of what it is to be at peace. Confusion, ambiguity, and uncertainty all challenge what you are experiencing in this hall today of predictability, stability and order, but I would earn my money as the men looked to me to give them orders, to lead, to accept and share risk. Lance Corporal Bishop, who will talk to you uh, two, as the next speaker but one, said um, this uh, of the O Group at Goose Green. Before we moved out of the assembly area, the boss, Chippy, gave the platoon a full six-phase set of orders for the attack. The mood amongst the platoon changed to a serious one. One of the younger members vomited, due to nerves, I guess. I remember thinking, fuck me, this is the real deal. I hope I perform well as a junior NCO. I must remember to use the ground well. Fire and maneuver, good fire control orders. Use good hard cover from fire. Personal infantry skills will keep me alive. I thought back to when the battalion had attended a church service on the MV Norland. The Padre had said, some of you will die, most of you will pray. He was right, I was praying now. Or as an interview many years later portrayed it, 13 pair of eyes to the left, 13 pairs of eyes to the right, the platoon ser sergeant, boss, you're on. So what did I do? I unleashed my sections with little overt command, but without losing the ability to influence the action. That is command, for it directs the subunits to their role in the action, not interfering with them thereafter, because that would detract from their ability to get on with their job. Remaining in such a position, physically and psychologically, that I could monitor the action and swiftly deploy the reserve should the opportunity arise for me to decisively influence the action. The section. On the battlefield, those with the least authority do the most. Hierarchies don't work well on the battlefield. Formed relationships do. It is where the famous Shakespearean phrase we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, really comes into play. We were short of just about anything, everything but the enemy and good leadership and the will to win and endure. 
You shouldn't need to be told if you analyze Goose Green, don't do a battalion attack with three artillery pieces and two mortars. It's not the way to fight a battle. At one end of the scale of combat activity is drill or drills, a precise, automatic, ritualized response to a given stimulus. In psychological terms, it represents conformity and a restriction of an individual's thought processes. At the other end of the scale is tactical skill, judgment, calculation. Battle is a mixture of the two. My sections were in the second category. They were tactically very good. And this was developed for two para and B company in particular in Kenya in um, November and December 1981. If Waterloo was won on the fields of Eton, the Falklands for two para was probably won in Kenya where relentless practice on those months with live firing that today would not pass any risk assessment for the modern army and would certainly go into the illegal category turned sections from the mechanical into those who were experts in tactical maneuver. Military expertise is measured by how efficiently one departs from drills rather than how well one actually does the drills. And those with stripes all performed admirably. Let me just mention Lance Corporal Baz Bardsley. He rescued Corporal Majerison, who you saw on the last slide, who'd been hit a couple of times at the gorse line at Goose Green. And where you see the yellow lines there, that sort of represents the enemy arcs over that sort of hill which we had to uh, go over. And this represents the Bocker House position by the gorse line. Now, Lance Corporal Bardsley rescued Corporal Majerison with no thought of his own safety. It was another example of leadership for the Toms to follow. On the individuals within the section, in war, there are three types. There are thrivers, there are stickers, and there are failures. Not everyone on the battlefield is a hero. But it was most difficult for the soldier. He had no map, he had no radio, he had had his orders late, he only followed with no clear idea of what was really going on. Yet he was largely responsible on the 28th of May for the success or failure of the campaign and British foreign policy. Those who suffered most were those who had newly joined, who had not been through the formal or informal bonding process into the group. Some of those will tell you that their struggle to fit in was every bit as much to do with the group and the cohesion of youngsters within the group as it was to confront the enemy. There were also those who had less resilience to keep going. Some, I now believe, used their feet problems, and we all had them, as an excuse to go sick prior to the second battle at Wireless Ridge. Some, of course, were very real, like uh, this uh, foot here, and, of course, that person's foot meant that he couldn't go on. But we are here at Sandhurst. The motto here is serve to lead. Do that, for your men and women deserve no less. Don't be like Milo Milo Bender in Catch-22. Without realising how it had come about, the combat men discovered themselves dominated by the administra administrators appointed to serve them. Now, war is a dung heap, but it's a dung heap from which grow some remarkable blooms of action and camaraderie. As Sergeant Barry Norman said on the 10th anniversary of the Falklands, it was the blokes, it was the section commanders and toms, and they went forward and they took the enemy positions, and they didn't do it for the Queen, they didn't do it for Maggie Thatcher, they didn't even do it for the Falkland Islanders. They did it for each other. As a postscript, here are the three section commanders in July 2014. It's Lance Corporal Bardsley's funeral. 
he'd committed suicide. It is my great pleasure to introduce John Meredith, also known as Taff. He joined the Parachute Regiment in 1967 and completed 43 years service, seeing combat in Northern Ireland, the Falklands, Iraq and Afghanistan. Among others, he retired in 2010 as a major, having picked up his late entry commission in 1996. John will be speaking about his experiences as a sergeant during the Falklands War and how he led his platoon through the challenging conflict. We are incredibly grateful John has travelled to be with us today. Please offer him a warm welcome. Uh, I was the platoon sergeant of 12 platoon D Company 2 para uh, in 1982. I had taken over as platoon sergeant early in 1982, so the platoon was fairly new to me, um, and I was obviously fairly new to them. As one of the Toms uh, said later, that they saw this bloke walking down towards the barracks who had a big tash and a look a bit like Yosemite Sam. He says, and then when they realized I was turning into their particular block, they all shit themselves. <laughs> we were quite lucky before we went down the battalion had trained in Kenya, and they'd done quite a lot of low-level training. But we were also given a month to play with the platoons. So I got the chance to go through all the battle drills with the platoon before we, uh, and the sections. The section commanders got a week with their sections. I don't know if you ever get that now. To take them out and run them through to get them all up to speed. So everybody was thinking the same. Then I got them for a week to get them running as a platoon, and then the platoon commander got them for a week to play with them. And so he got it up. My platoon commander was a Lieutenant Barry. He was not an infantry officer. He was Royal Signals on attachment. Uh, obviously, we sailed down to the Falklands. Uh, we got into our landing craft, which was fun. The particular side of the ship that we got on was the one that wasn't in the lee of the ship. So as the landing craft came up, you had to step across and then hopefully not fall off when it went back down. The CO was on the other side. He got onto his side okay. And we were holding up the whole advance. And the colonel um, had a very short temper and was shouting at us to hurry up. And of course, we were shouting back to fuck off because <laughs> it was a dangerous actually getting off. Luckily, it was dark, and he couldn't see who was shouting back. <laughs> Once we got onto the landing craft, it was a squeeze, and we got in there, and luckily enough, the, the uh, Royal Marines had set up Jim PMGs on either side, and we had 800 link by the side of each of them. By the time we got off the boat, they had 25 link left. We'd pinched the rest. Okay? You can always have more ammunition. We did the advance up to Sussex Mountains. Great. Got to the top, and while we were up there, the um, boys had actually been carrying blowpipe missiles up for everybody else. All the, all the companies did it. They got to the top. The bloke who was supposed to have the launcher had jacked halfway up the hill, and I had to send two Toms back down to encourage him to come up the hill to do his job. When he got up there, he was useless anyway, because they battered him to get him up there. <laughs> we were then dug in. It was not very nice. And if you've been to the Falklands, will know that. And then we were sidelined for a fighting patrol. So the platoon was briefed up. We were going to a place called Contira House, where it had been reported that there was three Argentinian LVBT-7s. Now, luckily enough, none of the Toms knew what, one of they, what they were or what they carried. I did. I'd been anti-tanks. However, the mission was then cancelled, and then suddenly it was back on. We should have been lifted by two Sea Kings. Only one turned up, as usual. So we went in two halves. 
Now, as you know, or you should know, when the helicopter drops you off, the, the crewman, if it's not in the, the place you're supposed to be, is supposed to give you a grid reference. They didn't, and the crewman nearly joined us on the floor. Okay, lucky he had a belt on, otherwise he would have been on the patrol with us, because he didn't get, do what he was told. We then met up, and we had to patrol to Kintira House, take the position. We didn't know if there was any enemy there or not. And occupy that position. We were only supposed to be out for 24 hours. The next day, we were told to move to another location, secure it for the rest of D Company, who would be coming down as a patrol and going on to uh, another position. They were 15 minutes away from us when they were turned round back up to Sussex Mountains. We had to go back to Kintira House. And from there, we then had to tab back up to Sussex Mountains, where we came back in after last light, which is not very nice, walking into your own lines in the dark. The next night, we then started the advance down to Goose Green. This is just to set the scene for what our, my particular platoon had been doing up to now. Okay? We were getting fairly worn and lathered. By this time, I had lost three men. Two with feet and one with a, with a knee that had um, swollen up to a massive size. And then the night we were back up there, we had another soldier go down with a suspected appendix. So I was four men down. Okay, we only went with the platoon commander three sections, two sections of seven, sorry, two sections of eight and one section of seven, and the platoon headquarters of five. Right, so we were, we were now four down, so we were under strength. So all the sections were down to seven men. The only advantage we had is we'd been given extra GPMGs and one M79. Okay, so instead of a rifle section and a gun group, we had two. And the GPMGs made all the difference. We advanced down to, uh, towards Goose Green, spent a night in a house, um, we were the first company down, so we got in the house first. And when the uh, battalion headquarters come down, they tried to shift us out. We weren't moving. Okay, until the next morning when we had to, because they could see who we were. And then from there, we then moved on to the attack on Goose Green. The section commanders, who had to have done all the work up to now, looking after their soldiers, checking feet, and it didn't matter how often you check people's feet, they were wet. You know, we carried spare socks, and you had the socks under your arms to dry them off, all the rest, all the good stuff that you all know about, a part of your leadership. And, uh, but still, people were going down with feet and other problems. The medical, um, platoon medic had five field dressings and three saline drips. That was the extent of the medical supplies for the platoon. Everybody had their own small medical pack that everybody carried. We advanced towards Goose Green, and somehow we managed to miss our guide and get in front of the commanding officer's TAC headquarters. And he wasn't amused when he came up and found that we were in front of him. We then started to, uh, the attack on Goose Green with two sections up and one section back. As a platoon sergeant, as you know, my job is to control the rear sections and to keep within one tactical bound of the platoon commander. As a platoon sergeant, you need to see what your platoon commander is doing. And also your section commanders. Um, the, other, the two forward companies came into contact and then we were then pushed forward in the, in the centre. And we hit a number of Argentinian trenches. This was our first contact with the enemy, and it was a night attack. One of my sections got slightly mislaid, which is easy to do in the dark, and while the rest, so we took out about seven enemy trenches and the people that were in them. On trying to find uh, my mislaid section, uh, I was coming back up towards the platoon, and I could see four helmets moving along a fence line. Any of those who have been to the Falklands know that fence lines are on the maps. And they, we 
I saw them as I came back up through uh, Company TAC 2 uh, with Captain Adams, who was the uh, 2 IC, Company 2 IC. I asked him if we had anybody in that particular area. He said, no. We put some mini flares and then we splattered these four argies. One of them tried to escape through my forward section and the boys got him. And uh, two of them were killed. One was wounded and one was okay. We cleared a number of trenches, and as we were moving forward, we, we used the trenches for cover, obviously, because other than that, it was pretty flat. One of my soldiers, Godfrey, jumped into a trench, jumped back out and said, Somebody's, something's moving in there. So he was just told to put a grenade in and then get fucking back in it. Which he did. From there, we then moved forward and then... We were behind B Company, uh, who were up forward of us and to our right, and A Company was over to the left. They come under fire at the Bocker House position, and we were the sort of ridge behind them. There was a, a minefield supposedly in front of us, and we were told to go firm there. We were taking a lot of the splashback that was being fired at B Company and A Company, and the company commander, Major Phil Neem, decided that we weren't going to stay there and told the commanding officer we were moving forward and we moved to the ridge behind um, where B Company was. From there, we had to move round. Uh, the plan that the company commanders um, made after the, the CO was killed, that we would go round the flank on the beach to take out the Bocker House position and then crack on towards the airfield. And this is what we did. On the way around the beach, we then had to come through, and there was a minefield um, in front of us, in front of the Boca House position. And the Argentinians had used orange baling cord as trip wires. Obviously, you can see it in the day, you wouldn't see it at night, in between the landmines. And as we were walking through and up, and the, and the soldiers were told to beware where they were obviously walking. The next minute, I, was, I thought it was a fucking sheep because I was eating grass, and my head was ringing. And as I looked to my left, one of my toms was sitting there going, it wasn't me, and he had orange string wrapped around his boot. Luckily enough, nobody was injured. Um, but when his section commander came in and said, we need to get him out, I said, leave the fucker in there. He tripped it. <coughs> We moved off from there, and we had to take all, all the Argentinians on the Boca House position. Quite a number were killed, quite a number were injured. Um, we got them, obviously made sure that they were secure, handed them over to our 10 platoon, and then the, uh, commander, uh, the OC pushed us on towards the airfield. And we moved across the front and up to a position uh, near the schoolhouse. At that particular position, um, we were put down to put su suppressive fire onto the schoolhouse and to get any RGs who tried to get back into Goose Green. So we had two sections doing that and one section in reserve. The platoon commander had kept the, the same section near enough um, as the lead section for most of the time, and I'd got him to change it round because uh, you can't keep the same people at the front. He then, it was reported, the Argentinians were showing some white flags up near a position that we called the flagpole position. There was a flagpole there, and there was a locating the enemy, winning the firefight, etc. So to encourage some of them, you have to either get to them and make them do it, or you have to threaten them in certain ways to make sure that they return fire. I had one of the soldiers who had his head down, wasn't doing anything, wasn't doing his job, and I told him to return fire. He said, but they're shooting at me. Fucking hell, good news, everybody was shooting at us. And uh, so then I said, well, I'll shoot you, and I won't miss. So he decided to return fire. Uh, we took that position, it was cleared, and um, we were then, went into reorg, and as we were reorging, we, got, we were told that there was friendly aircraft coming from the north, 
and a Picarda Strafters from the south, so there we go. Uh, later, we also dropped Napalm, which came very close as well. We were then pulled back that night, uh, told to dig in, which is quite hard with only a bayonet. Uh, the next day, as is now history, they were given an alternative and they surrendered and we moved into Goose Green. In Goose Green, obviously, we had to reorganize because now we were down, I was down to four NCOs and no platoon commander. Luckily, we had um, spare officers in the, uh, in the battalion and I was given a Lieutenant Page who uh, became my second platoon commander during that conflict. From there, you all know, if you've ever read about the Falklands, how uh, B Company leapt forward to Fitzroy, and then we were all moved forward, and then we were moved up to Wireless Ridge. Wireless Ridge, we were lifted by helicopter from Fitzroy to up in the hills, and then we tabbed round from there in the usual battalion snake around to Wireless Ridge. We had to uh, stop um, behind Longdon for overnight because of um, whatever. Uh, and then the next day, we, we started the final assault onto Wireless Ridge. Now, Wireless Ridge was our second um, full-scale attack. It was different to Goose Green in the fact that there was more support in artillery um, and mortars, etc. As we move forward onto Wireless Ridge, A and B Company were given two positions to clear. They went off, cleared them, and we were given um, a position on the right for, for us to clear. We moved through there, the Argies had already skipped, and then we were told to swing a left and fight down um, Wireless Ridge or the, the, the spine of Wireless Ridge. Um, it was interesting in the fact that we were now working with two sections. Okay, so we had two sections of eight and a platoon headquarters. And that was basically our strength. I think we were 18. Um, and coming down Wireless Ridge, it was a quite a long old trek. We were shelled by our own guns and with one man killed and one injured. And then we came under fire from the Argentinians and I had one man um, hit, who was hit, uh, he had, was hit in the head and a sucking wound to his chest. And he was, once he was got back, he got back to the medical um, field hospital, but he was the only person who ever got back there who actually died. From there, we used fire and maneuver under control um, of the section commanders and myself and the platoon commander to move forward to our limit of exploitation. The second time we come under serious fire when uh, young Slough was hit, everybody went to ground, as you do, uh, because it was effective enemy fire. And then I had to get off my ass and move around a bit because nobody wanted to move. The closest ones I could get to got kicked. Once further away, I threw bricks out, and we got... Um, got the, the uh, started to return fire, the drills kicked in, and we started to move forward. Okay, and the basic way we moved forward was that we would use a loom. We only had a loom for the two-inch mortar. We'd put a loom up, locate any enemy positions in front, rapid fire on them. Once the loom went out, then the section moved forward. And that way, we moved down the ridge till we reached our limit of exploitation which was a line of telegraph poles that went over the top. Once we, uh, we got there, we had to stop, and we became static. While we were there, we had three counterattacks. By this time, we were down to about, I don't know, 16 blokes. So with 16 men, we'd outrun the rest of the company. They were about 300 meters behind us because they were a bit slow and we had to stay firm. The Argentinians got close enough to uh, throw grenades at us. And they, they counterattacked three times. We had to call the guns in closer, so drop the fire in, 
so they got closer to us to stop them coming at us. And uh, the OC came wandering down while all this was going on. We'd beaten back another counterattack. The OC comes down all on his own. We were sitting in a shell hole, uh, which was quite comfy, four of us, with a puddle in it. Every now and then you just got a bit of shrapnel or something come whizzing in in the puddle and fizzed around for a little bit. And he comes walking down, stands there, and looks down and says, how's it going? And of course, because he then became a target and started attracting attention to us, so we, he was asked politely to go away. I fuck off. They're attracting bullets there. He said, if, well, if you're going to be like that, and he went off. Okay, we were quite lucky. I have a lot of respect for that company commander because he let us get on with our jobs. He didn't interfere at the wrong times. He didn't try to change something if it was working. And we managed there, we beat off these three uh, counterattacks, went firm, and the next day, obviously, um, everybody know what's happened. Yeah, they started to surrender, everybody moved in, and we had a lightning sort of, well, it became a race, really, who wanted to be the first into Stanley. That was basically 12 platoons war. Now, I had three very good corporals as section commanders. One, Corporal Sullivan, who was killed at Goose Green, had done his senior Brecon and had already been told when he was going to pick up his sergeant. However, that never happened. Um, the other two were nearly as good, obviously. He was the best. But we also worked three down. So we had a platoon commander, platoon sergeant next to take over. If we went down, the next one would be Corporal Sullivan. And in the sections was the same. Section commander, two IC. In each fire team, you had the senior Tom who was then step in. And that's what had to happen. And that was basically um, what we did. How you react to the soldiers, um, as you've got told in the one before, some people try to use feet as an excuse not to get there. You just don't let them go sick. Nobody went sick from my platoon, uh, from, uh, from Goose Green. In fact, we lost the ones on the hill. We didn't lose anybody else up there. Some of them, you, you've seen pictures. They were going around, and the people were lying down, looking at what size the feet were on the argies, because their feet had swollen up. Our boots were no good for them. So they get a pair of boots of an argy, yeah, and use his. Uh, and then when they got back home, obviously the feet went back down again. But you as junior NCOs need to know everything about your soldiers, the good ones, the bad ones, the indifferent ones, and you need to be fair. You can be the biggest bastard in the world, but if you're fair, your soldiers will work for you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm from 2nd Battalion, the Royal Gurkha Rifles. Right now, we are in best in Brunei. It is my great pleasure to introduce Paul Bishop. Paul followed his family by joining the Parachute Regiment in 1978 and completed his 17 years of service before retiring in 1995 as a color sergeant. During his time, he deployed in various types of operations, including the Falkland and Northern Ireland, to name a few. Today, Paul will be speaking about section commander during the Falkland campaign and the challenges he faced as a junior section commander in a shot of demanding situations, from the encouraging the soldiers under his command to dealing with his first contact during such a heated campaign. We are incredibly grateful Paul has traveled down to be with us today. So, well, let's offer him a warm welcome. Good morning, everybody. My name's Paul Bishop, and in 1982, I was a Lance Corporal Section 2IC within B Company of Tupara. 
Before I start, I'd like to just say a few things about my company commander here, John Crossland, and my platoon commander, Chip Chapman. Chip Chapman. They were both excellent leaders, commanders in the, during the Falklands campaign, and believe it or not, both of them could actually read a map. <laughs> Most of the time. I'd like to first of all just talk about some leadership points. Um, I can remember being asked as a young Lance Corporal, what is leadership? It's quite a difficult question to answer. You have to, you have to sort of think about it. You know, are we born leaders? Is it something we pick up at school or something we develop on the rugby and football field? Probably. You guys here, guys and girls here today have already shown some sort of leadership by being selected as NCOs, completing your NCOs carders, etc. So you're already there on the first steps of the promotion ladder. You've been given the opportunity and the responsibility to train, man, manage, and lead your soldiers in peacetime and operations. So with that responsibility, you should become good leaders. I believe that some of the values of good leadership are as follows, and I used these when I was in the army. You should be one of the fittest men, women in your platoon and section, and always lead by example. Be a good soldier in barracks and in the field. An important one, never expect your soldiers to do something that you would not do. As Taff already mentioned, fairness. Be firm, friendly, and fair, the three Fs. I used to use those. You need to be approachable as well. Remain consistent, I'm sure you are, in everything you do. Training, peacetime, and operations. Always keep the men informed. I can remember being a, a young Tom in West Germany in those days, uh, going on exercise for four or five days. I had a fairly weak Lance Corporal Section Commander, and he told us nothing for the five days, hardly, because he was lazy. Keep your men informed. I tended to sometimes overbrief the guys. Loyalty should go up, of course, to the officers, but make sure that you remain loyal to your guys. I see use 50% both ways. And like it says there, I firmly believe if you apply some of these principles, the soldiers under your command, they will trust you as a junior NCO, and you will have earned their respect. In late 81, it was already mentioned, the battalion went to Kenya on a six-week training exercise. We did everything live, uh, blank and live, uh, low-level stuff, sections, platoon attacks, company attacks culminating in a battalion live night attack. As also mentioned, the range safety rules were adjusted a little bit, they were bent, and we certainly brought in, well, John here certainly brought in the mortars particularly close when we were uh, training attacking positions. So in April, or late April of 1982, we departed all the shot en route down to the Falklands. On the way down, it took us about three and a half weeks. We had time to train. We mainly concentrated on fitness, aircraft and vehicle recognition, tactics, weapon training, and we did a bit of shooting. And also, most of us started to pay attention to the first aid lessons we were doing. This chip there doing a bit of PT on the upper deck of the MV Norland. And here this slide shows uh, four of the platoon about to depart into the landing craft from the ship to go ashore. And there are also some happy faces there from support company two power. So we landed on the 21st of May, the first battalion ashore. Uh, we had to march tab up to Sussex Mine, the battalion defensive position. I think it was about five miles and we were carrying Bergens. We probably were carrying about 100 pound plus in weight. Uh, my fire team was quite lucky. We didn't have to carry the two 81 millimeter mortar bombs. We had the SF tripod instead. So we had to uh, tab up with that. Most of the time we were passing it around after about 20 yards uh, between ourselves because it was getting too heavy to get up there, and we dug in there for about five days. 
As we started to dig down, the trench, some of the trenches filled up with water, so we could only get so far down, so you could sort of kneel in some of the trenches we, we dug. And before long, we were about to be attacked by aircraft. I think the first or the second day, we received the warning, air raid warning red, which means that an attack was imminent into the, uh, the ships at Port San Carlos around the beachhead. <coughs> I was luckily on stag, so I picked up the GPMG off the tripod. The gunner wasn't too happy. Uh, we'd received training on how to fire an aircraft uh, on the ship down to the Falklands. And I, I believe it was about 15 to 20 aircraft in front. You'd put up a wall of fire so that the aircraft flew into that. So I picked up the GMP, seen the aircraft coming in from the left over from the south from Goose Green. S squeeze the trigger, one round, bang, stoppage. <laughs> I was pretty gutted, pretty gutted, because that was going to be my, my first time I fired a, my, my weapon and anger in battle. Passed the gun back to the, the gun and told him to clean it. We had plenty of more opportunities to fire at the aircraft that were attacking the ships. This slide here shows the Skyhawk exiting, uh, in fact there's two on there, exiting Port San Carlos, flying up, up through the battalion. And the photographs were taken by a Tom in C Company. <coughs> the aircraft there is flying over B Company's defensive position. You might be able to see some smoke from our trenches there firing at that aircraft. And we managed to hit it. Every Tom and NCO in the battalion claimed that they'd fired that aircraft, by the way. <laughs> Who knows, they got it. I believe that the aircraft crashed and the pilot ejected over Goose Green. <laughs> the battle for Goose Green, on the, on the 26th of May, we moved down. We tabbed down, I think it was a bit, about 12 miles. We had no Bergens, no, no sleeping bags. We were probably carrying 50 to 60 pounds of weight in our webbing. Uh, we were issued with five magazines. I managed to acquire another five magazines and put them down the front of my windproof as a bit of protection. Uh, it was quite a hideous tab down, a battalion snake. Most of you have been on it. Stop, start, stop, start, run, slow down. We got down to Goose Green and laid up a Camilla Creek house for that night. So we received our orders for the attack, a detailed set of orders from Lieutenant Chapman, moved off to start line. We'd already fixed bayonets, moved into the start line. Everything went extremely well. Nobody spoke. It was all hand signals, got down. Our platoon was forward left. And then after a few, uh, few minutes, A Company's attack went into our left. They uh, crossed their start line about half an hour before. And all of a sudden, I could smell cigarette smoke. And I thought, well, we can't be that close uh, to the Argentinians. It must be one of ours. That was a signal then for most of us to light up. So the way we were thinking was, well, this could be your last cigarette. Sod it, you know, I'm going to light a fag up. Nobody complained. None of the officers complained that we were smoking. Obviously, it was a tactical cigarette down the smock, etc. How did I feel then? Total fear was the way I was feeling. The fear of being hit, the fear of being wounded, shot, killed. And also there was a small voice in the back of my mind thinking, what about the fear of failure? Because it, does, it did go through my mind, you know. Would I be able to carry on and attack the enemy position? Fortunately, when it did kick off, we were okay. The slide just shows uh, some of the an enemy 120 meter mortar pit. It may or may not be goose green. So we moved off from the start line. Everybody stood up and we advanced. Within a couple of hundred meters, Scouse, one of our section commanders, had his first engagement with the, uh, with the Argentinians. A guy stood up with a poncho over him. And although I couldn't really see, it was a very dark night. Um, the two of his gunners opened up. We had two GPMGs per section in those days and uh, immediately dispatched him. When the guys went through those positions, it appeared that a lot of the Argentinians were just hiding in, in their shell scrapes. They may have been sent forward to, de to delay us from, from the main defensive position. And all of those enemy were dispatched. We moved forward and five platoon, uh, four platoon had a, uh, took out a position to the right. And then shortly after that, that 
I think the company got slightly disorientated. I don't think it was a map reading error, John, was it? I think we were slightly disorientated. We managed to get back on our axis and head towards the main objective for B Company, which was Bocker House. <laughs> As it was getting light, we moved down across a forward slope, the two forward platoons. We could see some soldiers in the distance, or some soldiers were there near a bunker, kicking the ground, hands in pockets. Somebody opened up. An NCO shouted, stop firing, it's A Company. The firing stopped. A few seconds later, somebody else opened up from, from our guys. And an NCO shouted, the next person that, that fires, I will put on a charge. We went a few more feet, then we received a lot of incoming fire from the enemy position. So the point I'm trying to make is it was really difficult to identify the enemy. We weren't sure if it was friendly forces or enemy. We got down into a gully. The lead two platoons, company headquarters, and our, two, our front two sections with platoon headquarters pushed on forward. Um, it was at this point, Scouse, one of our section commanders, was shot in the shoulder and face, and he was brought back down into the gully. <coughs> we were pinned down by what appears to be at least a platoon up to the forward and right of our position, uh, three to 400 meters away at least, and, th and they were keeping us pinned down and we weren't moving anywhere. Five platoon to our rear were caught on a forward slope and we had one man killed and at least four wounded. This stage, the platoon commander gave us a task to clear a bunker, which was the initial bunker we'd seen up to our left. And I thought, well, I'm sure there's no enemy in there anyway. Why are, we, why are they sending us up there to attack it? So my fire team got down Brummy, my section commander, went up and assaulted the position. There was no enemy in it. As he got up onto that position, I seen him jump up, lay on his back, and pull his webbing off. I thought, oh, God, he's been hit. So I managed to get up to him, had hold of his foot, trying to pull him back down because we were on an intense fire. And I said to him, where have you been hit? He said, I've got one in the bollocks. So anyway, what had happened, he said, it's only a small nick. As a bullet had hit a stone, and the stone had ricocheted and just slightly cut his uh, scrotum. He said, the wife's going to kill me if those, those had gone at that time. But we were on the tenth fire, and we managed to pull back. We were pinned down for probably an hour and a half, two hours as a company. So what did we do as soldiers? We get a brew on. We weren't on a, on a direct small arms fire, so we, we got a brew on. And it was this point under great leadership that John Crossland here, the, the company commander, used every support weapon available, although the mortars and artillery were limited. They were brought onto that main en enemy position, and they continued to fire still after that. Shortly afterwards, that, after that, he uh, brought up the Milan from behind us. The Milan fired the anti-tank Milan weapon, fired over our heads, and uh, whacked into the, the main bunker, and after that, the white flags went up. As explained by TAF, then D Company came forward from our right and took that enemy position. As you can see TAF here on the left side of the screen, I think it is there. D Company taking uh, the enemy position at Bocker House. It's another slide I stole from the internet. So we then give them the orders to move. Brummy shouted across to me, my section commander. Uh, CO's dead, the adjutant's dead, two ICA companies dead, two of our friends, corporals in A company, had also been killed. How did that make me feel? We just felt more determined, more aggressive to go out and try and take out as many enemy as we could. It didn't affect, certainly, our morale as a, as a section, as a platoon company. We wanted to get on and take out as many as we could. B Company then moved round to the right, to the, to the west side of the isthmus, heading south, and we did a big loop uh, around to sort of the southwest side of Goose Green, and we came under artillery fire. We may have come under machine gun fire, I can't recall. We instructed our two gunners, our section, to open fire on the gun line, and they were way short. They were two young lads. So it was that time that we thought myself and the section commander should have a go on the guns. They weren't too happy about that. So we took the two guns off the guys, fired about six or 700 rounds each into the gun line, 
it was probably six to 700 meters away at least, and we managed to eliminate it, we think. The guns stopped firing at that stage. Shortly afterwards, as mentioned before, before last light, the Argentine, Argentinians reinforced his green with a Chinook. I think it was a Puma and about six UE helicopters landed. So it looked like a company was being reinforced to the Goose Green garrison. The company then pulled back to a hill under the, under the boss. We, we managed to get in all round defense on a small hillock about five, 600 meters away from where we'd been in contact. And uh, we were given orders to basically stand to 50% and await a counterattack. Fortunately, no attack came that night. And I think most of us fell asleep. We were just absolutely shattered after the, uh, the two days we've been going. Well, we fell asleep for an hour, then you woke up freezing cold, did a few press-ups, sit-ups, running on the spot, and then fell asleep again. As explained by Taff again, the next day the, uh, the Argentinians, Argentinians surrendered. Slide here, self-explanatory. There was three 105 light pack howitzers there firing at us. This may have been soldiers from the gun line, we don't know. After the surrender there, Goose Green, the Argentinians threw the helmets down, weapons, and then were marched away. I'll briefly go over the battle for Wireless Ridge. We weren't, I certainly wasn't too impressed that we had to go and do it again, but, but because Three Para had, had had a severe battle on Mount Longdon, their numbers were severely depleted. I believe the Wireless Ridge was one of their objectives after, objectives after uh, the battle for Mount Longdon. The difference with the Battle for Wireless Ridge was we had a lot of fire support. I believe that the, the battalion had 12 105 artillery guns in support and both two and three paramortar platoon, platoons uh, mortars were in support. So we had 16 barrels firing onto this position. So the position was pounded for quite a long time. We received their orders from CHIP. The NCOs went up and got their orders from CHIP before we crossed the start line. Of course, we're having a fag again on the start line. We received their orders and Chip said, I can remember now, oh, tell the blokes, after we received their orders, tell the blokes there's probably a minefield, or don't tell the blokes there's probably a minefield in front of us. So what is the first thing you go back and tell the guys? There's a minefield in front of us. We're going to have to possibly, well, we're going to have to walk through it. Fortunately, none of, us, none of the mines went off if indeed there was a minefield there, but the point I'm trying to make is keep the men informed. In addition, we had a couple of these, two, two scorpions and two scimitars in support, which were quite a morale booster, although they did tend to uh, cause fire to come back, back to us when they started firing, but they certainly uh, were good for morale. Casualties were light, as explained before. We lost three men in the battalion killed on Wallace Ridge, 11 wounded. The Argentinians' casualties were 25 killed, 125 wounded, and 37 prisoners. You see there, as mentioned before, the Argentinians had far better boots than we did. This is the ridge that D Company attacked us, as explained earlier by Taff. So, what are the lessons learned? If I can pass on some lessons learned myself. Ammunition and ammunition con conservation. Make sure you've got, obviously, be issued as much ammunition from your, from your scales. Try and beg, borrow, and steal as much ammo as you can get hold of. Fortunately, the Argentinians used the same caliber, 7.62, as we did. So we managed to take their ammo and use that. We were, it was everywhere. It was packed into our pockets. Spacing. I can always remember on exercise, the guys, and you've probably seen it yourself, when you're on exercise, they're always bunching up together. But when it's for real, they tend to spread out. So when you're training, get them to spread out and keep apart. Don't make yourself a double or a triple figure 11 target when you can just make yourself a single figure 11 target. Time, time goes out the window as soon as you cross the start line, everything's gonna get delayed. It can take a long time to locate the enemy and a long time to win the firefight. And just be aware if you, 
when you're winning that firefight about your ammunition, do you need to break contact or do you need to stay in contact while you're winning that firefight? Something we learned, avoid forward slopes. If you have to get, move down a forward slope, get off it quickly or get back. Target location, hammer it into your guys, fire control orders, encourage them to do it on exercises. And always carry digging tools. At Goose Green, we didn't take digging tools. We were told to leave them behind. I was quite astonished that we did leave the, leave the digging tools behind. But at Goose Green, we did. At, at Wallace Ridge, we did. We took them. I got these from the internet, some quotes there from General Colin Powell. The most important thing I learned is that soldiers watch what their leaders do. You can give them classes and lecture them forever, but it is your personal example that they will follow. War makes extremely heavy demands on the soldiers' strengths and nerves. For this reason, make heavy demands on your men in peacetime exercises, so train hard and fight easier. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. <coughs> a slide there when we were given a sort of end X, the helmets went off and the berries were on and we were moving down and like Taff explained before, it was a race in the Port Stanley. We were of course the first battalion to land, the first battalion to quote our Padre into action, the only battalion to fight two land battles and the first battalion into Port Stanley. Photograph of the chip and myself, platoon sergeant, the radio op. And finally, NDEX in Port Stanley. Well, thank you for listening and I wish you all good luck for the future. Um, my name's Lloyd Clark, I'm the uh, Director of Research at the uh, Centre for Army Leadership, and it's my very great pleasure to chair this panel of uh, question and answers. Um, I'm joined, or we're joined on my right by uh, Colonel John Crossland, who um, has been referred to um, on a number of occasions by our speakers this morning. Um, and he joined 10 Para as a schoolboy in the uh, mid 1960s, was commissioned into the Parachute Regiment <coughs> in 1967 and served around the world with both the Parachute Regiment and the SAS, served as a company commander in the Falklands, um, for which he, was re he received a, a military cross for the battles of Goose Green and Wireless Ridge. And it's a very great honor to chair this panel. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes asked why I became a military historian, because that's my profession. And there were two key events. One was the film A Bridge Too Far, and the second was the Falklands conflict, um, and I can remember as a 14, 15 year old plotting the movements of the Parachute Regiment and the Royal Marines on my Daily Telegraph map of the war and being absolutely fascinated by those events. And I've had the great honour and pleasure of chairing many sessions with Arnhem veterans, but it's the first time I've shared a stage with Falklands veterans. And as I say, I'm humbled to to be in this role. So thank you very much, gentlemen, um, for being here today. I'm sure there's so much that we can learn from you. Um, Simple Q&A session. If you've got questions, raise your hand. If you don't have questions um, that you want to ask verbally, please do put them on Slido. Um, I've got those coming in um, right now. There are some microphones that are roving around the auditorium. There's one up there. Ed Flower has got one and another one at the back. Please, for the sake of the live streaming and so that everyone can hear you, if you've got a question, I will point to you, wait for the microphone to come to you before you answer. Um, so ask your question, then we can all hear the answers. Okay, I'm going to um, start with a question from Slido, um, and this is to the entire panel. So, um, did leadership training before the Falklands provide you with what you needed during the conflict itself? Who'd like to start us with an answer to that one? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I learned most of my combat art, the four tours that I carried out with 22 SAS in a place called Dofar on the Yemen border. We were there from 70 to 76 in a supposed secret war. Out of the 200 men in the regiment at that time, we lost 12 killed and 85 wounded. The ADU 
which is the Arabic word for enemy, were trained by Soviet and Chinese specialists down in Aden, and they trained them very well. And the point I'm making is that if you don't get to the top of the hill, they were going to give you a smack side right, side left, and keep harassing you until you got yourself together. So very early on, I learned that there's no easy way to fight because no one appears on a battlefield unless they think they're equally capable of putting you flat in your backside. <clears throat> the last point I'll make on this before winding over is that um, even the SAS do not win every conflict. And particularly in Dofar, we were thumped badly at times. You just had to wipe your nose, pull your finger out, and get back on as a professional soldier. And that's what we're paid to do. Thank you. Um, I guess I have to sort of step forward, really, because I was CO2 para. And it was really as I, the things I implemented as CO2 para in retrospect from the Falklands, uh, or the Falklands informed what I really did. Um, so was I well trained as a leader by 82? No. Uh, the reason for that was I did a very, very short course at Sandhurst, a thing called POSIC 9 at the time. I did 17 weeks here because I knew how to put my putties on and strip and assemble an SLR because I'd been in the officer training corps. And arrived at 2 power without doing platoon commanders division. So your phase 2 training now, I didn't really go through. So I, when I was CO, I really did two things as a CO, uh, which you should do at every level in your command. The first one was ruthlessly trained the battalion HQ to be phenomenal planners, because you don't really have to do anything for company commanders. They're generally of the ilk of John Crossland, and they can just crack on and do things. And the second thing was, because platoon commanders are the two down from a CO, I did all junior officer education myself. And therefore, when I was a company commander, I also did all section commander training and platoon commander education myself, chutes and all that sort of stuff, which we didn't do a lot of in 82. The other thing I did as a commander, as CO, informed by the Falklands, was I carried a pistol. And I carried a pistol deliberately as a physical and psychological reminder that my job was to, co to command. And by that I mean at that appropriate level to cohere all the combat power available to you. It is not my job necessarily as a lieutenant or company commander or CO to be a rifleman. Command is about leadership and decision making and to bring maximum combat power to bear. So those were the things I took from the Falklands. I was not a bad platoon commander in war. The war saved my career because the one thing that I'd learned at Sanders was to do platoon attacks. I'd have probably been sacked if uh, I hadn't have gone to the Falklands. So also worth saying that we thought we were going to war on the 23rd of March, 1982. We were, I was actually in Belize. We were supposed to do a six-month tour there. And the Guatemalans had uh, a junior officer coup that day. So. We thought we were going to war in, against them because they claimed Belize. Um, we often get where we're going to campaign wrong. So always be ready for the unexpected. Um, I, um, I get meant the same route that most of you are. I joined the army as a private soldier. I refused promotion in, most of you weren't born, 1969. Uh, because it wasn't worth it, actually, 50 pence a week. Uh, who wants to do guard commander for 50p? <laughs> so I refused promotion then, and I, I, I also thought I needed to learn a bit more about what a battalion does, and I went to support company uh, as the anti-tanks. And while I was there, I, I, we had people posted in as NCOs who didn't know, know as much as I did, so I volunteered to go and do the platoon sergeants course, um, at Netherhaven uh, for the anti-tanks, which was the one back then. And I was made a local lance corporal, acting corporal, so they didn't have to pay me um, to do the eight-week course, which I passed, um, came back, and the CO decided that uh, I now needed to do a battalion junior NCOs card or selection card. So I did that, um, 
I was still anti-tanks, but I had junior Brecon, senior Brecon. So the route that most of you were following, I went through. Um, were we ready to lead? Yeah, I think so. The route that I had taken anyway had given me all the, the tools that I needed um, to do the job. It was just up to me then and my personality uh, to make sure that I did it properly. I mean, I, uh, before I went to the Falklands, had, we were never going to lose, as far as I was concerned. We were going to win. And the bullet that's going to get me hasn't been made then, so crack on. Yeah, I think uh, we were well prepared. I certainly was. Um, I was put in NCO's car to, at, at the age of 18 still, because oh, I joined the ju junior para at the age of 60 and off. So I was in the battalion a year, a year virtually. So all the NCOs, yes, were prepared. We'd all done the battalion NCOs course. Most of us had done what we called then junior Brecon section commander's battle course. So we're prepared. And we also, in the parachute regiment, we encourage soldiers to use their initiative and to take over if need be on exercise so that's perhaps something to think about for the future but yeah we were well prepared and well motivated and Taff says there was uh, no inclination that we were ever going to lose in the Falklands. Thank you very much okay we'll go to the floor now can I uh, see some hands raised for some questions to the panel please. Stony silence not one question. Okay, well, I'll go, I'll go back to Slido, but please do think um, of some questions. I'd like to take some from the floor. Um, I think all the speakers um, spoke about the casualties um, that were suffered during the, uh, the Falklands conflict. And we have a question here about what leadership challenges did dealing with those casualties pose you during the conflict? Who'd like to take that? There are two uh, points which are very relevant, I think, and particularly in two para. Uh, H, took, H. Jones took over after we'd been in Ballykindler for 24 months. I joined them after the Warren Point, where we lost 16 killed in the blink of an eyelid, which is about the same as what we lost at Goose Green. H came in as a new broom uh, to a... a a unit that had been on, instead of on a room on tour with the families, uh, the only people left behind were the band and drums and the rest of us were out running around after the bloody IRA and all the rest of it. <clears throat> so we needed a break and a change of pace. Uh, Chippy and people have talked about the, the training we did in, in Kenya, which little did we know that we put into, into proper practice uh, less than a year later. I think... Uh, One's got to be able to teach people, to inform them, and then you test them. And I think this is what I try to apply to, to B Company. It, and I would set the, I went to CH when he took over, and I said, there's B Company's training program for the next 18 months. And he was a bit startled at that. And I said, well, I have no intention of B Company doing admin fatigues in fucking Aldershot. <clears throat> and he got the message and we carried on with our training and in those days I could ring up Wilton which where the army headquarter used to be and ask have you got an aircraft that wants to do some low level flying because we've got some self loading freight here and we'd love to jump out can you drop us in kill the forest or wherever it happens to be now nowadays people look at you and gasp there's only about three Hercules flying or whatever <clears throat> but the training has got to be demanding, it's got to be interesting, it has got to be challenging, and this, this will promote the, the will of the young NCOs as you are to think hard about the training and not just do it, forgive me, like a guardsman. You're not marching up and down outside some palace or whatever, and believe you me, I did a month of that in 1968, and that was quite enough for me. <coughs> what I'm saying is that the training of the youngsters starts with your good selves and should work up and be respectively worked downwards. If they were out training, then I was there just watching that people were training to the standard that I made perfectly clear was going to happen. <clears throat> on the boat on the way down, again, you've been briefed about that, I was convinced that 
we, despite General Haig, the United States Secretary of State for Defense running around uh, trying to stop Lady Thatcher from doing her what did you want, she eventually handbagged him and told him to fuck off. <coughs> I said, as soon as we land, we will be engaged. And <laughs> this is at eight and a half thousand miles from England. So every single piece of toilet paper, bandage, bullet, bomb, grenade, oil, you name it, went down that logistic chain. And, and the real, and I don't like using the word heroes anyway, but the real people who made it all work were Ivor Helberg and the Commando Logistic Regiment. They had to deal with the Commando Brigade, attached with two and three para, we're of similar, similar time, but much better. No, no res disrespect there. Fire Brigade turned up, they didn't know what logistics was, they had no logistic capability at all. It was complete shambles from that side of life. So the people who made it work, and please remember this, if you get your, log your log logistic problems badly wrong, you are going to fail. Because if you run out of bullets, and again you've been told, fortunately the Argentines had the same calibre as ours, uh, their food was slightly better when we can get hold of it, their boots were much better than ours, our kit was worse than Korea. John, I don't know if you can, in the IT section, can you put slide 23 on the map of Goose Green for me? Because it will help illustrate the point. If you say there are two parts to war, that there's a mechanical part which can be learnt, you can read pamphlet 45 or whatever you have as your uh, infantry pamphlet these days. And so the first part of war is a mechanical part which can be learnt. The second part is the understanding of it, which may not. And in a way, the battle for Goose Green or the orders illustrates some of that mechanistic approach. The first thing that casualties do is disrupt your tempo severely. Things go a lot slower whilst you're dealing with your casualties. The second thing is the psychological impact. Not necessarily on people within the platoon necessarily, uh, that, that does occur. But the real illustration that I remember is we had several sets of brothers in two para in 82, as a lot of your units will. Uh, fortunately, none of them were serving in the same platoon or often the same company. So Bish, he's little Bish. His brother was big Bish. Uh, he was in C company. So if you take our company, for example, that's the slide. If you take our company, for example, my radio operator was Beast Kirkwood, so-called because he was supposed to be the ugliest man in NATO. He wasn't, but his brother was a radio operator in A Company. His brother was hit. The impact on Beast Kirkwood when his brother was hit was severe. Our company radio operator was a guy called Corporal Stu Russell. His brother was a radio operator in A Company. His brother was hit. The impact on him when he heard his brother was hit was very severe. So the mot motivating those people, if you managed to get that slide up, John, uh, was ad absolutely severe. So tempo of casualties disrupts what you think is your potential timeline. And don't forget that war is actually all about the psychological aspect. It's not just the physical aspect. It's for that reason that we knew after our first attack that we were invincible because we'd creamed through the enemy. And the illustration I want to make of this is, um, uh, yeah, it's just off the, off the end here. I don't know if, um, when you look at all the timings we were given, phase two is over by 0600, phase three is over by 0700, phase four is over by 0800, phase five is over by 0900, phase six is by 1000, i.e. before it's light. That never happened. Every phase was supposed to be one hour long. That was mega over-optimistic. Um, casualties, to be honest, are a pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> it disrupts everything that you've got to do. It, uh, as soon as somebody becomes a casualty, somebody's got to take on his duties, and it makes everything harder for those that you're left. You know, if somebody gets themselves wounded, because of bad personal skills, well, it's their fault, it's not yours as a leader. Yeah? And you shouldn't take on the fact that if blokes aren't doing what they're taught to do, then it's not your fault. Um, I, we started off with 1 and 27, I think it was, and ended up with 1 and 16. 
Okay, not all dead, um, but all casualties. So if you take three quarters of our platoon became a casualty during that conflict, yeah, that meant what was left had to do everything else. It made stags longer, uh, rest shorter, carrying everything around became more difficult because there's no way I was going to dump any of the heavy, any of the GPMGs. You know, that's our, most of our firepower. So you've got to take that in mind. So you've, everybody has to carry more. You need the same amount of ammunition for those weapon systems to do the job. Yeah? You can't say just because I'm down to two sections, I'll get rid of a section's worth of firepower. You keep that firepower, and uh, you just have to carry the more. I mean, Bish mentioned when he was talking about magazines. We were issued six magazines. Well, we, at my platoon, we, took, we emptied the armory. We had ten. So you had ten magazines. The normal ammunition load was ten full magazines. One was a 30-round mag, which we'd stolen uh, from C Company because they had the uh, Bren guns. So we'd stolen a 30 mag from that. So everybody had the initial 30-round mag as a contact mag. We had 200 rounds of, of ball in a bandolier, and every man had 300 link. Okay, that's every rifleman. On top of that, we were short of grenades, so we, we, instead of having a couple of grenades each, most people had one grenade, and we had about 366s, or 266s per section. Yeah, they would only carry one day's rations, and buddy-buddy system, you could go for two days. Okay, and then you split the rations down in, in the fact that you carried stuff that was any good. So rolled oats, apple flakes, I don't know if you've got them now, and uh, chocolate powder, all that will go into one, and that was your main meal for the day. And that's how you, you survived. But ammunition was the important thing. Casualties, removing casualties is a pain. Yeah, because everybody's tired, and if you have to lift and carry somebody back, you, the blokes come back and they're absolutely knackered. Right? During the attacks, somebody is hit, you leave them. You don't stop, you get through, get onto your objective, take your objective, go through your reorg. After you've done your reorg, then you go back and deal with the casualty. You can't have people stopping halfway through an attack to look after their mate because he's been hit. You've got to keep him going. Yeah, I think briefly just to say that during the attack, the advance, uh, we were briefed, the SOP was to step over the, any casualties we received and just keep going. So they were dealt with. It didn't have any particular effect on ourselves because we only had one man shot in, in the platoon. He was brought back, uh, bandaged up, etc. And of course, then we took all his magazines off him, more ammo for us. Like So that's how we uh, dealt with our casual casualty. And it didn't affect myself personally, any leadership issues with it. Great, thank you. Um, if there are any questions from the floor, please do raise your hand and um, you'll catch my eye. But I'm going to go back to Slido now. Um, oh, there is? Okay. Thank you. Um, do you feel that the modern army has become severely hamstringed by the bureaucracy that we now have upon our training? In, in that I mean that we as junior NCOs can't just take the guys out on the back area and do training anymore. This takes weeks and in most cases months of planning. And with our dwindling white space and our commitments, it's really hard to sort of plan that far ahead and therefore do that low-level training. Yes. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why I say that. I've, um, and I hope he's not going to get in trouble for what I'm going to say. My, my son's in the army. Uh, and I worked for General Mattis at one point. And Mattis used to say, if you've got um, good people and bad process, bad process wins out of t nine times out of ten. I'm not saying the army's got bad process, but I'm saying that the bureaucracy um, has been amplified so much from our day. Uh, you know, the amount of paperwork you have to do to do anything based on, you know, risk assessments and health and safety, we wouldn't recognise. I don't think we would recognise your sort of orders, not because the process has changed, you know, the paragraphs of the orders are the same, but, I mean, I still have my notebooks and orders from um, the Falklands. You wouldn't believe uh, how brief they are. It's a very small notebook, 
and one or two pages launches us off to, to go from the beachhead to Goose Green. You, know, you would be planning for hours and hours and hours and have lots and lots of stuff. We just didn't do that. We just got on and did things. Now, we didn't have Mission Command in 1982, but we absolutely had ABI, Airborne Initiative, it was called. And that's exactly my point I was making about the difference between a really good unit and an average unit is a one which can depart easily from process and drills. So I'd like to see you get back to just doing things simply uh, without WhatsApp groups pinging you every hour of the day and all things like that. It's, it seems to me that there's more process and not enough execution. You probably noticed by now that I'm not politically correct. Never have been. <coughs> no operational battlefield I've ever been on has either been health or safety. <coughs> and certainly political correctness should be put in the toilet. <laughs> However, that doesn't mean to say that you can rove around the battlefield being totally um, uncontainable. Once your enemy has decided it's, it's had its had its stuff knocked out of it, then you treat them with respect. And the, the best compliment that we got after McGoose Green was by a young platoon commander, Argentine, who latterly got their Victoria Cross equivalent. He came up to me and he said, can I have a word, please, sir? I said, yeah, what's the problem? Because we've been out clearing the uh, battlefield of the dead and the wounded and all that business. He said, well, you hit us three times. And actually, I think he appears on one of uh, Taft's photographs with a head bandage at, at Bocca House. <coughs> and he said, he, he said, you kept on hammering away at us like alley cats. You just never stopped. And now you're delivering us, uh, bringing our wounded in, caring for our dead, because their chain of command are completely broken. Most of their dead, the dog tags have been ripped off their necks by them, not us. And so in, in order to try and... Uh, find out where they were. We didn't have GPS in those days, so we had to try and make a rough grid reference and whatever other applicable things are on the body. <coughs> Once we'd, we'd, I said, well, that, that's the way the game's played. My blokes have got the greatest respect for you youngsters, and we had the same very age of range. We, we received five new recruits, I think, before, just before we sailed, who can only have been just about 18. There was, there was some younger ones than that. So <laughs> I said, yeah, we respect you for what you, what you have done. Uh, you were beaten by, uh, yeah, hopefully, a better led, better trained. Their chain of command, as I said, completely disappeared. And I said, but please don't put us in front of any of your people who ran away, because we've got no respect for them at all. <clears throat> I'll leave it at that. Um, as I mentioned, I was luck we were lucky enough to have a month um, to train the platoon and to give section commanders a week so that they could look at their section. If you don't get time to train low level with your sections, you will never know where the weak links are until the shit actually hits the fan. And then it's too late. Okay, because if you've got more than one weak link in the section, you're in trouble. And if you haven't been able to identify where that weak link is and work on him and to ensure um, through persuasion that he does his job correctly yeah and there's many different ways to persuade people you know there's a shovel on the back of the head that works um, there's also putting him on your shit list and keep him working that way yeah when he thinks he's tired make him tireder until he gets the message either to leave or to shape up and work properly but without the chance to work with your soldiers at low level, you will never identify the weak links that you've got. And that's in any section, in any platoon. And we all, army training is all geared, so we all come out of our respective training establishments, at Catrick or wherever, at a certain standard. Yeah, well, that's the start. So they come at that standard, but then you need to know how well they can maintain that standard when they're wet, cold, tired, miserable, uh, uh, hungry. Yeah, we used to have a quartermaster who would deliberately not deliver rations on exercise because you were supposed to carry uh, emergency rations on your belt 
so you wouldn't get fed for a couple of days. Yeah? So you learnt to make your, last, your rations last continually. Yeah? So in the Falklands, same thing. Every time we went to move somewhere, they give us four days rations. Well, you've got belt order on, you can't carry them. So, fine. The logistic system worked where they were giving you rations, but you couldn't carry them, so you had to leave them in your Bergens. It was okay when the Bergens finally got to you four or five days later. Yeah, you had a great scoff. Yeah, but that's the way it goes. So you've got to make your troops physically, but also mentally robust. Yeah? A lot of people say you've got to make them hard. No, you've got to make them robust. And so that they can take the hits and keep going. Yeah? And you as NCOs, when they're knackered, you still have to keep going. You have to get around them. You have to look after them. Yeah? You have to make sure. That, and that comes from when you do it in training. So when you've run them into the ground and they're absolutely knackered and you're still running around doing your job, looking after their welfare, making sure that they're okay. And by welfare, I don't mean that you're giving them a scoff and stuff. You're kicking their ass to make sure they're doing it themselves. Yeah? But no, you, you don't have enough time, I think, that's my personal thing, to actually train your troops now and get them in the best shape possible for when they get thrown into the ship. Yeah, it'd be, be a difficult question for me, to, uh, for me to answer. I left the Army in 1995. It must be a complete nightmare for you with all the risk assessments and health and safety regulations these days. So in answer to your question, I don't know how you'd fix that. Can you pass it back up the chain of command and let them know how you feel? Is there a mechanism where you can pass up and say, look, we're not getting the time to train if, if, if you have that issue? Great, thank you. Uh, time's really running out. Uh, that, that half hour has gone really very quickly. So I'm going to try and summarise um, a few of the questions and just ask our panel, what is the one piece of leadership advice you would give your audience here today? Just one piece of advice. Three things. Cohesion, cohesion, cohesion. <coughs> yeah, never follow him in the dark which we did at Goose Green. H was a, a very good commander, but on the day after we'd done the, the night attack, and we'd done four or five other objectives on that night, we'd, we'd been the Argentines all over the place. Daylight, we were on a forward slope. Uh, and someone said, well, why are you on a forward slope? Well, shit happens. <clears throat> it was the machine gunner that probably killed H about four and a half hours later on. I had to change the entire plan because I was then told to take over and uh, <coughs> when you look at it formally there uh, most of it is irrelevant because we were in we were in the wrong place we'd been moved sideways by the weight of fire coming at us we had to readjust and then once we got the Milan up we managed to break the Boca house we then got to the gorse line and all you could see coming out of Goose Green was this amazing blast of AAA fire coming at us. And Chippy said to me, there's a lot of fire coming up here, boss. And I said, well, you're even shorter than me, mate, so don't worry about that. I said, but do look out for the little mine mines there because you might reach Goose Green quicker than you want to. <laughs> I think the, the thing is, it's all about a self-belief in what is possible. And that's something that if that gets blown away from you, what I would say is that you've got to have a confidence about you, but not be cocky, but you've got to instill that confidence into your team. And let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, we are building for the future. And you are the future, but remember that people following you on will look back and say, well, were we, good? Were we properly prepared? Thank you. Um, there's, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, never give a bad order. And what's a bad order? One that you wouldn't obey yourself. So, you know, if you want people to do things, you've got to be able to, are willing to do it yourself. Uh, lead by example whenever you can. And be firm and be fair. Yeah, I think from what I would answer to that question would be train as hard as you can. And if you can't physically train, then at least you need to sit down and discuss what, how you want to do things. And also, never assume, always check. 
Thank you. Great. That wraps up um, this session. Um, some of you may have come here today thinking that um, the Falklands War is just relevant in history books. And I, I hope that what you've seen and heard this morning proves that it's a very live subject. There's so much that we can learn from it. And we are um, really grateful as a cow. I'm sure on behalf of the audience, we'd like to thank the panel very much for their time and for their insights this morning. Please give our panel a warm round of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's uh, Cork Joe Patterson. I'm an uh, instructor at the Royal School of Minch Engineering. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be introducing Lieutenant Colonel Charlie uh, An Antelm. Uh, Lieutenant Charlie Antelm is a former soldier who brought the hard uh, worn lessons of conflict to a successful career running a business uh, and, and, and he does that in some of the world's most challenging and emerging markets. Charlie, for much of his military career, was a UK Special Forces officer working to the highest strategic level of multi-agency and multinational operations. With a military career spanning 18 years, he has conducted multiple tours of duty in Iraq, Afghanistan, Northern Ireland and the Balkans. Today, Charlie will be discussing how he was thrown into commanding the Welsh Guards during their fatal tour of Helmand after the death of Lieutenant Colonel Rupert uh, Thornhall in 2009. Uh, the Welsh Guards experienced some of the hardest fighting in Afghanistan, and Charlie will be discussing uh, the leadership challenges the battalion faced throughout. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome Charlie here today, so please join me and, uh, uh, in clapping and welcoming him on. Well, thanks very much. It really is a great pleasure to be here. And um, I must thank the gentlemen at the front there. When I was a schoolboy, I really admired them. Um, they're probably feeling quite old. I'm feeling quite old looking at you lot. So between us all. But the interesting thing is, everything that they've said, I hope you'll see parallels with the things that I'm going to talk about, albeit in the modern context, or, or at least in the last 10 years. So... In 1997, I was based in Fork Hill in South Armagh in Northern Ireland. I was a relatively new officer commanding a half platoon or a multiple, I don't know if you still have those, and our team was at the loading bay about to go out on an evening clearance patrol when the South Armagh sniper, Michael Carragher, shot a Royal Ulster Constabulary policeman, Ronnie Galway, through the thigh with a 50 calibre round from a Barrett rifle. This was the first shot I had heard fired in anger, and I was immediately tasked to cut off the northern road in what was the rather forlorn task of trying to catch this highly professional gunman. I was concerned about a come on. In other words, they, they draw you on to blow you up. And I think someone talked about Warren Point earlier, so this was in our DNA to avoid such activity. And as a result, I was taking rather a long route to my cut off position through a tangled riverbed that ran through the town. Over the net, my company commander was incensed by the delay and I was taking a real bashing. I think it's fair to say that stuck in the middle of the riverbed, getting shouted at down the net, my map was upside down and I was flapping like a budgie. And someone talked about the two officers here being able to read a map. I've never really been very good at directions, so I've always needed good non-commissioned officers around me who are all over that stuff. Anyway... As I was in this parlous state, very quietly, Lance Corporal McAvoy, who's in the face graph there with the T-stripes, came up and spoke to me. Sir, I know the best route to the cut-off position. Follow me. And it really was that polite. If it was the paras, if it had been taff, I'd have had a shovel over the back of the head. <laughs> but because it was the guards, everyone was a bit more polite. So it was, sir, come on. Uh, Anyway, we got to our cut-off position. We, uh, we didn't catch the shooter. He was long gone, but he was captured two months later, as it happens, by the SAS. But three important lessons to me from this incident. First of all, the guys on the ground need to be left to get on with it. When you're on the net, it's no good beasting people. You're there to help, especially if you're sitting in a warm ops room. So, you know, go back to your commanders when they're saying, sit rep, sit rep, sit rep. It's like I'm trying to do my job here. Um, the second 
interesting lesson, I think, from this, and it's been sort of talked about in roundabout ways, is that as a platoon, we had trained together very hard, pre-deployment training for Northern Ireland. We'd laughed together. We knew each other. We liked each other. So when I was dropping the ball, essentially, help came without judgment. And Court McAvoy didn't sort of hold it against me or think I was a crap officer. He just helped me because he knew I needed it and the team needed it. And the third thing I learned was that on that fraught evening in a hostile village in Northern Ireland, I first experienced the magical power of a British Army junior NCO. And that's what you guys in the room can bring to the party. You'll all know that uh, 19 years ago, and it feels like yesterday, Al-Qaeda hijacked four planes. They flew two into the Twin Towers in New York, one into the Pentagon, and after a wrestle in the cockpit of the fourth, they forced it into the ground in the countryside of Pennsylvania. In total, 3,000 people were killed and a further 6,000 were injured. Single biggest terrorist attack in history. US President George W. Bush, supported by the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, launched attacks to rid Afghanistan of Al-Qaeda, where they had plotted these atrocities. And eventually, the UK found itself deployed en masse in southern Afghanistan, by this time with a string of conflicting objectives. We'll come back to that a bit later. Who here has served in Afghanistan? Yeah. So you, you know it well. Two years after 9-11, 2003, we also found ourselves invading Iraq. Initially to stop Saddam Hussein using his elusive weapons of mass destruction. And then again, for another string of conflicting objectives. So having only heard one shot fired in anger in South Armagh, I soon found myself on multiple tours of Iraq and Afghanistan, hearing lots of shots being fired in anger, and alarmingly some of them in my direction. But today's talk is going to focus on the gritty Welsh Guards tour of 2009. And I say gritty because it, wa it was gritty in a different way to the gentleman in the front row there. I mean, not as gritty, I would say. I think what those guys had to put up with, doing all that stuff and in the cold and wet. I've never, I've never been in a cold war. I've only been in hot ones. It makes quite a difference um, when the weather's a bit better. Having said that, I want to give you some of the context in which our junior NCOs were operating, but also to draw out some of the nuggets that I hope will have some value in whatever situation you find yourselves. And I'm conscious that not everyone here is an infantier. How many infantiers? Yeah, so, you know, quite a lot of junior non-commissioned officers um, in other roles. How many, how many cal cavalry? <laughs> Um, I mean, I firmly believe that the, what we're going to talk about and what the guys from the Falklands talked about is really applicable at every level of the military. CGS has to train his guys. He has to make sure they've got the right ammunition. He has to make sure they've got the right values. You know, it's exactly the same as what you're doing. It's the scale that differs. And I'd say, and these photographs are actually from my civvy career, uh, looking for oil in East Africa, running a security company and now running a big facilities management um, or being part of a big facilities management company. All the things that we're talking about today apply in Civvy Street as well. Less probably the fact that you need lots of ammunition. Um, but I think you're being well prepared for life both in and out of uniform. So in 2009, between April and July, the Welsh Guards Battle Group was on a ground seizing operation called Panther's Claw, suffered a number of fatalities. This included an officer at every level, which is recognisable to our guys from the South Atlantic, but it included the commanding officer, Colonel Rupert Thornley. At the time, I was uh, a major working in the MOD for General Chip, uh, and I was asked to switch my office, the bottom, uh, bottom there, the shiny place is the uh, MOD, the top place is my rather swanky flat, in uh, Battersea, where I was living the dream. And I switched those for Shawcat, Ford Operating Base, and the field as my office. And when I was told I was going to take over this battle group as a major, not having done any of the training, I think it's fair to say that 
I was suffered from a, a certain amount of apprehension and disquiet. And I think, Bish, was it you that sort of said, yeah, I was terrified. <laughs> and it didn't matter that I'd done a lot of stuff in the military, because the truth is that you can always get scared, and you can always feel out of your depth. And, you know, it, it goes on and on through life, sadly. And at that time, I was extremely nervous. But when I got out there, I found a headquarters that really wanted to help. There's a chap called Lieutenant Colonel Doug Chalmers, had sort of plugged the gap between Rupert's death and me turning out. He's now a Lieutenant General. And that gave me the confidence to get the job done. From the perspective of junior NCOs, we were three months into a very grueling, physically and mentally challenging tour. People were exhausted, they were under intense pressure, and with a further three months to go, there didn't seem to be any let up and the enemy was still attacking in numbers. The large-scale advance to contact, which had proved so costly, was being replaced by a framework of offensive operations, defensive fights, and nation-building missions. It's worth noting that to feed ourselves was a 10-day high-risk surge operation. So we actually spent most of our time being a self-licking lollipop. But we might cover that when we get into questions. Suffice it to say, our work was cut out. Now, for you guys, the challenges are slightly different to our forebears. This was not a war against a uniformed enemy, as the one that was described so vividly this morning. Statistically, not as dangerous as Goose Green, but in terms of judgment and complexity, this was challenging stuff. We had started a mission to deny Afghanistan as a safe haven for Al-Qaeda. But this plan had shifted into a mix of democratic nation building, schools and elections, counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency operations. The enemy might be foreign fighters with a rear base in Pakistan. They might be local farmers who have paid $10 to shoot at British troops. They might be planting sophisticated IEDs packed with Iranian technology to deadly effect. I was of the view that we were trying to win over the local people and therefore killing some of them was going to be unhelpful. For the junior commanders, this demanded a very nuanced judgment of what weapons should be brought to bear. Up to this point, people had gone quite large with indirect fire assets and that had been the norm of previous tours. We coined a term called courageous restraint, which at the time was very popular and then later became very unpopular when people thought they were being able to, to ask to take unnecessary risk. But my sense was that most of the junior commanders really understood the balance between taking a certain amount of risk to protect and stop civilian casualties and risk for the li their lives between winning the firefight. When I got to theatre, um, these were the orders that I gave to all my junior non-commissioned officers, and in fact, to all the team. And I'm pleased to say, Chip, that it is still only two pages. So if we look at the plan in general, convince the locals that we bring security, allow NSF to build a strength and the capability to take over. I think the UK failed in that. Kill unreconcilable enemy and change the minds of the undecided. I think we killed some people. We never captured anyone and I'm not sure we really changed many minds. Secure freedom of movement. We did a little bit of that. Specific tasks, deliver elections, we did that. Rebalance in the south, capture Gerepesheshkale, we did that. Prepare for relief in place, yep. Specific tasks, all done. What I'd really like you to look at is the right-hand side. This was the initial talk to the soldiers. And we'll come on to sort of casualties and the reputation and why we were there a bit later. And I obviously wanted to G them up because actually people really care what's thought, what, what people think of them. And that first line, to go to them and say, look, people think what you are doing is amazing, gave them a lift. Everybody needs a pat on the back, whether it's a general or a, or a guardsman or a trooper or a para. But if you look at point three, I think that really comes to the talk this morning. We had to maintain our standards and in fact, we had to up our game. I wanted precision strike. 
I didn't want to just drop bombs on everything. I wanted people to be very careful about who they were killing. I didn't mind people being killed. We just had to be careful who we were doing it to. Maintaining the moral compass. And that starts at the top and ends at the bottom. Battle discipline, battle procedure, all the things you've talked about. And fighting spirit. Something that you've heard a lot about this morning. Now, because we're at Sandhurst, and I don't want to talk too much about sort of leadership um, techniques, but I think serve to lead is a pretty good one. But the one that Stan McChrystal, the famous American general, taught me and I like is mission, team, self. Because it prioritizes the mission above the team, and it prioritizes the team above yourself. And I think if you get that right, it creates a virtuous cycle, which means that actually self is pretty well looked after as well. And I was pleased, uh, again, in Bish's talk, when he talked, well, we just stepped over the casualties. The mission was to close with and kill the enemy. The mission wasn't to look after the team. See what I mean? And I think if you always bear that in mind, you're, you're going to come up with the right decisions. And if you think about the strategic defense review coming up, you'll have three, uh, you'll have the Army, Navy, and Air Force all probably putting team before the mission. And I'm not saying they are going to. But that's what happens at these things. And you hope that the mission wins and that we come up with a solution that's going to be right for defense rather than either the self or the team. Mission has to, mission has to prevail above all else. And that works at junior section, you know, section TIC level, because you will have those choices to make. I asked one of my company commanders, um, how he saw this work in reality in the field. I quote directly from him. The best NCOs just dug in and remained fixed on the mission. But because they were not dicks, the blokes followed them. One NCO, post an IED which took the leg off one of the guys, was told by me to get up and keep going. He took a breath, walked across to his chin strap blokes and said, follow me, and they did. Another NCO, after a firefight, when told to get his men up to pick a live Taliban hit by our sniper, tried to rally his guys, and they chinned him off. The former is currently the regimental sergeant major of the Welsh Guards. The latter left the army. And I think what you heard from the guys at the front about fairness, about maintaining the standards, showed itself in that incident. I don't think we can talk about Afghanistan without, uh, without alighting on the figure of the bomber man. Is anyone in this room... Um, being a Barmer person. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. That's the metal detector sticking out of his pouch there. When the Welsh Guards um, arrived in Iraq, this potentially fatal role was taken on first by young officers and by junior NCOs. And that leadership by example that's been talked about today, not doing what you wouldn't ask someone else to do, came to the fore, fore in that scenario. In fact, the commanding officer, Rupert Thornlow, also took his turn on the Barmer on a fairly regular basis. When I got out to Afghanistan, I didn't take on the Barmer man role because I was scared. And also I thought to lose, to, to misquote Oscar Wilde, which probably doesn't happen very often in the Churchill Hall, I thought to lose two commanding officers would be regarded as careless. That's a sort of intellectual joke. <laughs> Don't have to laugh. Um, Another Welsh Guards Company commander was recently giving a talk at a school about courage. And I just want to read what he said. Halfway through our tenure in Southern Helmand, I announced at the end of an orders group that the 19-year-old Corporal Hill would be rotated out of his role of keeping a self through exposing himself to untold risk as a bomber man. There was no surprise. Everyone was happy with that decision. But when the group split up and returned to their routines of cleaning weapons and smoking endless cigarettes... Corporal Hill waited and then shuffled up to me, wiping the sweat from his brow and the snot from his nose, and grunted, keep me on it, sir. I'm better than anybody else is ever going to get, and I'll keep us all safer. That's what real courage looks like. A scrawny, shirtless teenager opting in a moment out of the limelight to take more risk for the benefit of others because it is the right thing to do. End of quote. And I think what's described there is cold courage. That's not necessarily the preserve of star performers, people that come top on their courses. It's something deeper. 
and Chip talked about character in war. I think there's a good example of it. But it also tells us that despite the headlines that we're doomed and millennials are useless, I think this chap was probably a millennial and did pretty well. In terms of resilience, when I arrived in Afghanistan, the battle group was exhausted and people were starting to fray. And I was shocked to arrive at one of our outposts to find an unshaven soldier whose boots were falling apart in a sanger with no sense of his arcs, no range card, no orders for handover takeover. Basic stuff that any junior NCO would grip. And I was sympathetic to the road that had led to this state, but I, I was equally sure that this was the thin end of the wedge in terms of battlefield discipline. And I growled quite hard across the battle group about standards, and that included dress and turnout. And I can see Johnny rolling his eyes about a blood, another bloody guardsman. But what I was trying to touch into was the DNA of a battalion, a guards battalion. And I drew inspiration from the story in Robert Graves' book, Goodbye to All That, who wrote, which he wrote at the end of the First World War, that regular guards battalions very rarely got trench foot because of their admin and rel relentless um, application of battlefield discipline. And, I mean, I was interested to see that in the Falklands, trench foot was also an issue. So, you know, looking after your feet, one of the fundamentals of the infantry soldier, whether it's World War I or the Falklands War. Personally, I saw this element of bullshit as an extension of good battle procedure. And painful as it was, it did start to change the tone in the battalion. People started to sort of take a bit more pride in themselves. You'll also be pleased to hear that we upped our aggressive patrolling and as a result, attacks on our location started to reduce considerably. The point that I'd like to make to you is that each of you knows instinctively what is expected. And your own regimental story has in your DNA the things that make you brilliant. And I draw on that to make sure you maintain the standards that are expected of you. And this is an area that I would describe as moral courage. So we've had cold courage, this is moral courage. The popular and easy route is often not the right one. And generally rolling up one's sleeves, leading by example, makes this stuff easier. The importance of setting the tone in pre-deployment training and continuing to rehearse and train throughout operations cannot be underestimated. And I think that's come through thick and fast from the talks this morning. The cliche of train hard, fight easy applies to every junior NCO and you're in the prime position to influence it. Although I'm disappointed to hear that your training opportunities are less than they used to be. In terms of um, managing your teams, I think there's so much to be said for communication. And again, Bish talked about uh, telling the blokes what they need to know. Communication is key to everything. I think compassion is important. And I would also use the word um, unashamedly love. And I'm not so, you know, as, as one of my company commanders put it in the vernacular, and I don't mean touching each other up, we'll leave that to two para. Three para, I beg your pardon, two para. <laughs> Is there anyone here from three para? <laughs> um, when it comes down to it, if you're a dick to your men in peacetime, you'll be a dick in ops and that rarely ends well. Love your men and they'll follow you anywhere. The manifestation of this is not tree hugging, early finishes, but a hard work ethic, unrelenting rehearsals and drills, ruthless standards in turnout and timeliness, exacting detail and a critical eye, but with humor and a light touch. They will love you for it when you nail it on ops. Bullying is right out. And I think that pretty much reflects what you've heard this morning about your place with your team. You've got to nurture them, but you've also got to drive them. I think the importance of supporting each other across the ranks should not be underestimated. And the bond between British soldiers of all ranks is something to be cherished. And it used to be fueled by tea and cigarettes. I think you're still drinking tea. I don't know what you're doing for cigarettes. How many smokers in the room? Yeah, I think you're going to really find that helpful on operations. <laughs> what is it, e-cigarettes? What's happening? I don't know. <laughs> okay. You've heard from the guys in the Falklands this morning about the 
junior non-commissioned officer's role in, in the shooting part of a war. And forgive me if what I'm about to talk about now is teaching you to suck eggs, but I think there are, there are four roles when some dramatic event unfolds. And I'm not necessarily talking about contact. You know, some of you might be trying to get a vehicle out. Some of you might be dealing with an aftermath of an IED. But I think in the first instance, you're, you're the doer. You're as likely as anyone to be close to that difficult situation which may be unfolding, which is why it's great to be a junior non-commissioned officer, by the way. We all want to be in the thick of it. But it's up to you to own that situation as best as you can, whether it's winning the firefight, breaking contact, bringing in fire, or providing a vital combat support role. I think the next task that happens when you've sort of got your shit in one sock, to use the old expression, is to be the deliverer of information and the trusted advisor to your, your leader, wherever he may be, over the net. Because you're a thinker as well as a doer. And I would emphasize that at this point, I think honesty is absolutely key. And that was hammered home to me on selection. You know, if you lose a bit of kit, you say you've lost a bit of kit. You know, trying to cover stuff up to try and paint yourself in a bit of picture is the road to disaster. So honesty is always the best way. And bringing, building that trust between you and the, the other leaders in the group, I think, is an essential attribute from training and time together. The third is that you're then likely to pay a part in subsequent action. And then finally, you're the reserve for the officer or the sergeant if they come unstuck, in the same way that he's the reserve for you if tactical action requires further intervention. And interestingly, we heard this story about Taft doing exactly that, stepping up when he was needed to. And you know, you guys should be prepared, guys and girls should be prepared to do that. And to make all this work under pressure, You've got to be well rehearsed and you've got to be a tight team. And I think trust and building trust is the key. A really good example of this is, can be actually seen on YouTube. Channel 4 got the headcam footage of a great Welsh Guards junior non-commissioned officer called Lancelot Leon Peake, Lancelot's full corporal. In the aftermath of his platoon commander being shot, Saint Peake wins the firefight enables the extraction of his officer, Lieutenant Mark Everson, to the patrol base, and then tries to organize the heli extraction, tragically due to poor communications with the headquarters and a lack of lift, it came too late. And poor Mark, who'd been shot through the shoulder, bled out. It is heartbreaking viewing, but it tells the story of a team in contact and the regard and the respect between an officer, his non-commissioned officers, and the whole team. You know, he was a good bloke, and his cousin's here today, I just found out. Now, I'm about to tell you a story that takes us back to Iraq, and this is really about you being paid for your judgment. You mustn't be shy about speaking your mind, stepping up. You should always be bubbling with ideas and initiative. I love the idea of airborne initiative. It shouldn't be the preserve of the airborne. It should be the preserve of all of you. You're all paid to do it. Um, I was, in, uh, I was in Iraq uh, as a company commander and uh, the intelligence came in that the date palm outside our camp is, ha was holding a cell of uh, foreign fighters. The commanding officer said, Charlie, I want you to go and clear that um, date palm plantation. It's a three company operation. I mean, as in the company was three company, not three companies to do it. And it's your mission. And I was delighted. This was my chance to win some glory. Sort out the military cross. Cheers, easy. <laughs> Gave my orders, and uh, that chap there, Rob Gallimore, uh, took me aside at the end of the O group and said, uh, Charlie, look, I know, you're a, you know you've done lots of soldiering and all the rest of it, uh, but that date palm, I mean, it's dark. It's going to be quite hard to find them. You're going to be stumbling around. It's, we've got three tanks. They've got night vision, thermal imagery, they're armoured and they've got machine guns. Why don't they just drive up through the middle of the wood? Try and find the enemy. If they see them, they can just machine gun them. You know, tell three companies to watch DVDs. I said, actually, Rob, that is a very good idea. And that's what happened. In fact, there weren't any enemy. The intelligence, as usual. Is there anyone here from the intelligence call? <laughs> no one that's admitting to it. But I think the point of that story, and it's not a story about an officer, it's a story about... You guys, when you're in a situation, there are many ways to skin a cat. 
and sometimes they might be safer than going up Route 1. Route 1 has its place, as we heard this morning. I like this image because it sort of enables us to talk about three things. Are there, how many snipers in the room? Yeah, very good. I think snipers are an incredible military asset. And I, do, I don't know whether in the Falklands they were able to come to the fore much. I mean, a lot of night fighting and all the rest of it. But the only time I've been in a, a co combat situation that involved trying to unseat a dug-in enemy, they had Milan at them, they had mortars at them, they had strafing from jets, and they still kept getting up. One guy quietly on the side with a 50 cal, I think, dispatched about 30 people. So, you know, there is something to be said for the sniper, and I would encourage those of you that are thinking about doing the sniper course to do it. This um, slide also makes me think about the nature of contact in Afghanistan compared to the nature of contact in um, the Falklands. You know, our guys were going out, 100 pounds, body armor, 100 degree heat, wandering, wandering towards an enemy position unidentified that had been well selected by the enemy. And they'd hear on the ICOM, the little microphone, that the, uh, the, 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 the interpreters had, yeah, there's a contact imminent. The locals are starting to talk about how they're going to attack you, which is a bit unnerving, isn't it? I mean, it's, contact is about to happen. Everyone knows it's about to happen. You start shaking out. You get your spacing and all the rest of it. And then the rounds start coming in. Well, at that point, there's a flurry for cover, and everyone's trying to bomber their way into cover so you don't step on an IED as well, which in itself is a bit alarming a winning of the firefight, and they may be calling in some artillery to try and negate the, negate the problem. The enemy, meanwhile, has got there on a moped, has found himself in the corner of a wood line, has shot at you, has stashed his weapons, they've gone one place, casualties have gone off on a moped, and then that same person, due to the rules of engagement, can walk out of the wood line in his native garb and can't be taken on. So, I mean, incredibly frustrating uh, sort of combat operations where you can't ever quite get your hands on the enemy that you're fighting against. And that requires a lot of judgment and patience from people like you. Coming home. No one's really talked about this. When, when the battalion uh, returned home in 2009, they were shattered. We brought all the, battalion, uh, all the companies of the battalion back together at the Lakeside Darts venue. Anyone here a darts fan? Anyone been to Lakeside? There's one at the back. What's your name? <laughs> it's not a dog plan, you have been there. We went, we went to Lakeside and um, everyone shared their war stories. And the point of that was really to avoid that internal struggle as who had the tougher war, which inevitably you get in a competitive environment. In fact, honours were pretty even and it was a cathartic experience. We needed our leave and when we held the intercompany, and we, we held intercompany rugby as a sort of final group therapy session. And for the most part, Smiles returned um, to the battalion around the summer. It took about six months and the Smiles started returning. But we also had bereaved families. We had amputees. And we had one or two people struggling with the whole experience. And Lance Aunt Peak, uh, who I described so gallantly, led the extraction of Mark Everson, killed himself a month ago. And, you know, the, the years, 10 years, just rolled straight back for me when I received that phone call. So there is something for all of us as leaders, as veterans, to think about that other stuff, the people for whom the op tour doesn't end, that there isn't index. And I think we as the leaders, past, present and future, do have a duty in that space as well. Some motivations for going toward do not change through history. In the summer of uh, 2010, I saw a junior NCA who had a pretty tough tour in, uh, in Helmand, and he was already starting his deployment training for the next Herrick, which was due in 2012 for the Welsh Guards. I said, what do you think about this? You're going straight back to Afghanistan. He said, well, on the last Afghan tour, I, I bought a house, and now I've got to sort the roof out. And he just shrugged and smiled. So, you know, we're motivated by many different things, and of course, the money always helps. So here we are in uh, 2010. Oh, no, we're not in 2010. What are we in? 
2020. And um, you're operating in a world as complex and challenging as it has ever been. You know, our various enemies are working to undermine the democracy that we hold precious. And this country has been maturing since about the 15th of June, 1215 AD. Can anyone tell me what happened on that day? Well done. What regiment are you from? There you go. Splendid. Um, you guys know better than I that every unconventional weapon they can wield is being used against us. But I'd also mention, and General Chip mentioned this in his chat, they've also started to develop a very impressive conventional arsenal. And you can take one or three or four state actors that, that are sniffing around at the moment. Add to this a global population explosion, climate crisis, and you as the young leaders of the British Army will have plenty to keep you occupied in the years ahead, sadly. But in these uncertain and challenging times, I believe we still have something to learn from the clever 27-year-old in the photograph on the left. Anyone can identify him? Yeah, Mr. David Sterling or Colonel David Sterling. Can anyone identify the clever 31-year-old on the right? <laughs> um, but he fervently believed that the status quo can be challenged. And we've talked about that initiative, that imagination and innovation have a vital part to play in war. And I would urge you to add to the rock solid foundations of your military heritage, flair and imagination. And, you know, I was disappointed as a commanding officer in those three hard months in Afghanistan that no one at any stage sort of called me aside, not a, not a corporal, not a lanceant, not an officer, not a company commander, to say, I've been looking at this problem, and I think waddling out of our bases, getting shot at and dropping bombs is probably not the most sensible way to do business. And even if they'd said, can we all get dressed up as uh, Afghans, buy mopeds and go and thwack them round the back, I would have been delighted. But we had become quite binary in our thinking. Deployment training, these are the drills, this is what you have to do, and that ain't the way you're ever going to win anything. So I would sort of urge you as the future leaders, and you are the, the future brains, the future sergeants, the future LE officers of the British Army, the future officers, you know, to think outside the box a little bit, because I tell you, the Quds Force of Iran, they're pretty good at it. <laughs> you know, the Russians are pretty good at it. So we need to slightly up, up our game in terms of initiative. David Sterling, by all uh, regards, and I should think Johnny probably knew, knew him, I, I didn't, but had a persuasive way with people and understood them. And I would offer him, in summing up his ethos that he thought up for his new regiment in 1941, which I think is a pretty good checklist for all of us for whatever we go on to do. The first one, the relentless pursuit of excellence starts with training, a large dollop of moral courage, leading by example. It is hard work, but when your team is running well, nothing will feel better. Self-discipline, number two. Most of us struggle in our lives with self-discipline. When General Chip gave me a cigarette outside just before this, my self-discipline had cracked. But it is an essential quality in a soldier, and more so in a junior non-commissioned officer. Classlessness. Well, thank goodness we're less class-ridden than we were when David Sterling thought up that particular part of the ethos. And his intention wasn't to overturn military rank system, but it was really about every team member having a respected voice, and that not being based on any number of snobberies be it rank, be it education, be it cap badge. Somewhere in the people that you're commanding, there will be someone with a better idea than you. And I love that idea of 50% up, 50% down. Yeah, below you, you've got some amazing people and you need to harness everything that they've got. I think that's what David Sterling was really talking about. And the last um, tenet is humour and humility. And I think the ability to find humour in the darkest of situations is one of the greatest gifts this nation has bestowed upon us. And long may that continue. And as for humility, 
The famous Catholic author C.S. Lewis put it like this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Or as one of my old regiments would have said, don't big time it. That concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move straight into questions. I'm just going to pull out the chairs. Um, if you just um, stay where you are, just a couple of minutes, and we'll go straight to the floor for the first question. So please do start to think of what you might last like to ask. I mean, can, I, can I just say before we get into that? There's plenty of Afghan veterans out there, particularly among the directing staff. There's a lot of experience at the front as well, so, I mean, it doesn't need to be about me. If every, other people have got stuff to add, please fire it in. Okay, we've got a first question just up there. Thank you. Afternoon, sir. Um, this is more of an acknowledgement, really, but you mentioned the struggles of the guys coming home after Herrick 10. Um, myself, I was in Babaji at the same time, so I had first-hand experience and I knew a lot of what was going on. And then in 2012, I was attached to the Welsh Guards, the Prince of Wales Company um, in Neri Siraj. So a lot of those guys that had been on 10 and gone through that tough time, those tough times, were with us in, on, in 2012. Um, and staying in touch with a lot of them now, I've obviously noticed how a lot of them are really, really struggling still 11 years later. Um, do you think enough has been done all this time later for these guys, because like you just mentioned, Lance Sergeant uh, Peak um, passed away recently. I, I knew his brother. Um, I think that brings the total number to about six now from that tour who have sadly taken their life. So again, do you just think enough has been done for these guys? Uh, look, I, I mean, I think the, the best thing we can do and I mean, I think in, in the short answer is I think there's lots of mechanisms out there, there's no lack of goodwill, but I think maintaining the communication and trying to gather in some way or other with your former comrades is a good piece of therapy because no one is going to understand what you've been through better than people that have shared those experiences. And I don't think it needs to be formal, I don't think it needs to be regarded as that, but I would encourage those people to get back together as often as they can with, with those people that they've served with. I also think that, you know, some of the people, statistically, I mean, the army will tell us that some of those people are just part of a demographic that, that have re reached that stage in life where things haven't gone well for them. And I think a lot of this, you know, depends on the circumstances that you find yourself in. If you've had a very difficult fighting tour and then life as it did with Leon Peake, sadly, then throws another pile of crap on top of you. I think it's quite difficult. So I think what we have to do is try and find those people that life has not been kind to and help them to find an alternative way. I mean, I'd be interested if, if, if anyone from the, from the Falklands ha has a view. Yeah, I, I thought you might ask me a question because I told you that um, Baz Bardsley committed suicide. And I put that in deliberately because Baz Bardsley committed suicide, but I don't think it had anything to do with his military service. Baz Bardsley committed suicide because his wife had died of cancer and he'd sold his medals. Now, he had a very unusual medal group. Uh, he had an MM, modern equivalent of an MC, he was on exchange with the 82nd Airborne in the first Gulf War and got a Bronze Star from the Americans. And he had a BEM, so he had a very unusual medal group. He sold for £123,000. And he invested the money in a gym. He was a big bodybuilder. So his wife died of cancer. He was ripped off by his business partner. His business went down the tubes and it was, fuck it, there's no reason to live. It was nothing to do with the military. Now, I sort of tweet on Twitter, and I see all these people who are saying another military guy is, or ex-military has committed suicide, which may well be true. 
Uh, more people commit suicide in Durham in a year than ex-veterans. So you have to be really, really careful on some of these statistics. Every one of those, of course, is a human tragedy, but don't necessarily fall for this trick that everyone is broken by being in the army. That is simply not true. Thanks, that's Thank helpful. You. Yeah. Any more questions, please? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, we've all seen in the past uh, several years uh, the budget for defense being cut. So I've heard from you like uh, you'd like to see like the junior soldiers to up their game. So to yourself, look at the money that the government gives to the defense. Do you think your dreams will be realized for the, ju for the junior soldiers to up their game? And the second question is, if given a chance for yourself to sit on the defense budget review, <laughs> What advice would you give to the government? Because obviously, the soldiers, if they see their money is getting taken away, their morale goes down thinking like they're useless. So what would you advise the government, please? Well, <laughs> <laughs> good luck, Charlie. I think on the, in answer to the first part of your question, I, I mean, I'm not sure that money is what's required to create great junior leaders. I think opportunities to train and the space to train and ammunition to train does sort of come under, under budget. But I think there's a whole, I mean, when I was your age, you were a bit younger, when, I, when the Falklands War was going on and we used to go to the cinema and they had a guy called Frank who was skiing and then going paragliding and all the rest of it. And you'd look at it and you'd think, yeah, I want to I wanna, I wanna be there. And then there was that program, The Paris. You probably, were any of you guys in it? You know, and then you'd watch that and you'd go, I want to do that. And there wasn't, pots of cash, but I think there was the sort of ability to do adventure training to get out. I think all those experiences can help you to become better junior leaders. I think you've got all the knowledge to use the initiative to understand politics is there. You've just asked a political question. You've already asked a question from a junior non-commissioned officer that maybe in the past wouldn't have been asked. So I, I don't think it's about money. I think it's more about your attitude and what you do with the opportunities that are given to you. What I would hope for the defense budget I mean, I heard Tobias Elwood uh, on, the, on the radio uh, two nights ago. 2% doesn't seem like enough, given what we're, be, we're, we're asking our people to do. And I would hope that it's balanced across the three services to fight. I mean, what, is, what do we want to do? What are the enemy trying to do to us? And then build a defense capability to match that threat. Uh, and, you know, I don't, have, I don't have the exact knowledge, but I would have thought you don't want to shrink the army much more, given the fact that our enemies still live in places and people we try to help still live in streets and houses and we still have to, at some stage, eyeball the enemy and eyeball the people we're trying to help. So that's, that's where I'd stand on it. General Chip does this for a living on telly. Um, I'm just practicing at the moment. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, what leadership skills do you think um, that we tend to gain through hard work in the military are really valuable beyond the military in civilian street? And what leadership skills do you think we should sort of maybe forget about uh, when we do move on uh, after our career in the armed forces? I think all, all the things that we've talked about in terms of character, in terms of attention to detail, turning up on time, wanting to work as a team, looking out for other people. I think all those have a really good resonance in the, in the civilian world. And I can tell you, a lot of it's lacking in the civilian world. So you're already streets ahead of um, you know, people that haven't had the experiences that you've enjoyed and that we've enjoyed over a slightly longer period of time. I think what you need to do uh, to be successful in Civvy Street is slightly change the chip you know, the three-letter abbreviations, the, um, the, the, the drills, the kind of, you know, and you need to translate that into whatever environment you're then going on to work, work in in Civvy Street. And we, we are all civilians in this room now, so it will come to you at some stage. I hope you stick with it longer, but when you do go, I think you'll be well prepared. But I think you just need to change that slight chip and remember that civvies sometimes need a bit more cajoling than, I'm not sure you can throw bricks at them when they're not doing, <laughs> when they're not doing what they should do, 
which is, which is a great shame, because I think more of us should have bricks chucked at us to get going. Great, thanks. Any more from the floor? Now, I've got a, a question here on Slido. Um, how much would you encourage junior NCOs to be morally courageous and speak their minds? Well, I think there's two bits to that question. I think being morally courageous, I don't think, it's, I don't think that's a, a choice. I think you have to be morally courageous. And I think a lot of that falls to the officer corps, dare I say it, to set the tone on, on operations for moral judgments. I mean, you know, we all need to be told what the, what the boundaries are and what the orders are. And I would hope that, you know, values and standards are stuck to in terms of speaking your mind, I think every organisation should have um, the openness to let people speak their mind. And as I said in my talk, you should be fizzing with ideas. But equally, when you go to the platoon and say, I've got this wonderful idea, I don't think we need to wear boots, they're a bit uncomfortable, I think it should be flip-flops, and he tells you to fuck off, then you've got to just get on and do what you're told to do, which is, you know, the way of being a soldier. And I think our leaders, I mean, in Afghanistan and Iraq probably had some different ideas, and ultimately their leaders said, no, that's what we're going to do. And here we all are talking about it 10 years on. Do any of our Falklands veterans have anything they'd like to share on that, that particular point? Thanks for us. I mean, I think one of the problems that you've got is you're seeing Charlie, who's you know, a great leader, and John Crossland and Bish and uh, Taff Meredith, all great leaders. Um, when people email me about this, they don't email me about the great leaders they work for. They email me about the toxic leaders they work for. And to my mind, the army needs to get better at all levels of maybe formally um, introducing some sort of challenge function. So Charlie's right. In your OODA loop, you know, observe, orientate, decide, act. Before you decide, if someone does have alternative ideas, you need to have a challenge function almost built in. When the boss man decides, the challenge function ends until you go through the next cycle of the UDA loop. Uh, and it's that toxic leadership which is potentially the problem. They are often very difficult to challenge. And I've seen that also in Civvy Street with another government department I work for doing something where people were fearful of their promotion and careers if they questioned what the toxic leaders and special advisors to a particular home secretary um, might have said and you know that's a difficult environment to be working in the only thing other thing i'll add to that there's a very good book again by stan mccrystal called leaders uh, and i don't expect you to go and read it but the point that he makes is that some of the most successful leaders are not necessarily the best people now as we as you know stalin was a fantastic leader of the russian people but you probably wouldn't want him over for tea so we've got to, but we've got to maintain the values and standards because I think at the end of the day you undermine your own position if you don't you don't follow those because we are fighting for we're fighting for something that we believe in, democracy back to 1215 and onwards. You know other people aren't. So I would I would beg you to hold on to doing the right thing. And I think instinctively everyone in this room knows when those moments arise. Okay, I think we need to. Oh, sorry, John. Just one point. <clears throat> there, are no, there are no free lunches out in Civvy Street, believe you me. You know, if and when it comes to your time of leaving the armed forces and going out into, into business, then you've got to come prepared to pick up the, the waste paper bins and empty your buckets and all that business because no one else is going to do it. And very often, the very senior officers, great respect to Chippy, you know, they, they have their PAs and ADCs and ADA, uh, camps and all this business, there's no one there for them. You'll be paid a lot of money, and they will expect you to come up with the goods. And it may be, well be that you have to chase them around the office and give them a good clout, and they will respect you for it. But on, on the other hand, you have got to come to the ball fully dressed and ready to get in and, cha and change things if, if that's what, what is required. So it, it's, it's, you know, the, the lessons... And Charlie's already mentioned that, that you've learned or will learn in the, in the armed forces will stand you in good stead, provided you don't become like a military shit 
and can't see the black from the white paper.